The details of the Trans-Pacific Partnership have been revealed, and now the 12 member nations have taken the deal back to their own governments for ratification. Here to discuss the obstacles ahead in closing the deal and what it will all mean for Canada, we welcome, in Washington, D.C., Laura Dawson, director of the Canada Institute at the Wilson Center. And with us in studio, Stuart True, editor of The Monitor. That's a monthly journal for the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. And we welcome you two back to our airwaves. We had you on a few months ago to look at this thing, and now we're glad you're back again. Let's remind everybody the TPP consists of more than 5,000 pages of documentation. It is a significantly large agreement. There are 12 nations, as we suggested in the TPP, not China significantly. And the TPP market consists of nearly 800 million people whose economies combine to $28.5 trillion worth of economic activity, and about $2 trillion of that is us. Okay, Laura Dawson, get us started. Initial impressions, first of all, now that we know more about the TPP, of what you think of the agreement. I'm cautiously optimistic. It is a, uh, a work in progress. It was a way to update the NAFTA. It's a way to integrate Canada into other economies in Asia and places that we wanted to be. Uh, it's primarily a defensive agreement for Canada so that other countries don't get a competitive advantage over us. So it's got some strengths. It's got some areas that are a little bit uncertain, but I think ultimately there's enough safeguards in those areas of uncertainty that Canadians can be pretty happy with this agreement. Stuart True. Well, I, I agree, and I remember the last time we had this conversation, uh, we agreed that it was a largely defensive uh, agreement for Canada. There's not a lot of new access, new gains that can be had for many of the export uh, areas, goods exports for Canada. We've seen, uh, now that the text is released, that's true. Uh, there's not, a, not huge gains, there's going to be no huge jobs from this agreement. Um, areas where we might see some added benefits into, say, the, the Japanese market for certain agricultural products, beef, potatoes, that kind of thing. We've got to remember that we're competing with the United States in a lot of those areas, so it's basically the status quo. On the flip side, there's a lot, I think, to be worried about in these other chapters that Laura mentioned there uh, with that you know, most people don't, uh, wouldn't recognize have a lot to do with trade. Uh, but there's a lot of red flags that have gone up since the deal was uh, was made public. We'll start to unpack those as we go along. Perhaps one of those red flags was raised actually by a man who was sitting in that chair uh, just, uh, well, I think, uh, six or eight weeks ago, and that was Jim Balsillie, one of the co-founders of RIM, who expressed massive disappointment over the TPP, says it's the worst thing the Harper government has ever negotiated. Specifically, he's concerned about the intellectual property rules, and I want to play a little clip from that interview, and then we'll come back and chat. Roll it, please, Sheldon. Innovation economy is a set of rules, and you create the rules to advance your prosperity. And if you can get people to take rules that advances your state's prosperity, well, good on you. But my point is, understand how the game is played, understand, have a dialogue with business where you know what rules are helpful and not helpful, and get in the game and play shrewd and sophisticated. But that's what America does. It does so well. Uh, congratulations to them, and I'm simply saying, Take a page out of their pay playbook and start playing with them. Don't just comply with what they foist on us. So Mr. Balsley's view clearly is that Canada's negotiators got outmaneuvered by the American negotiators. What's your view? Well, well, they did. I mean, Canada is going to have to take a lot of the rules that were, that were designed mainly to benefit U.S. Uh, corporations, whether it's the entertainment sector, whether it's uh, pharmaceutical drugs, uh, software sector, that kind of thing. Um, Canada is going to change its copyright regime again, having gone through a long five-year process where we came to a nice balance uh, with multiple stakeholders here in Canada. We're now being asked, for example, to increase uh, copyright terms, not just on audio recordings, which was done in the budget by the Harper government, but on, on anything that, that receives a copyright, books, this kind of thing. That's going to add costs uh, to consumers. It's going to add costs to schools. Uh, and other areas which, uh, which wouldn't have been the case without the TPP. Um, pharmaceuticals is another area where, again, um, although Canada will say we've simply maintained the status quo, there weren't any concessions, that's only half true. Uh, that takes into account that Canada made significant concessions on pharmaceutical patents in the European deal, which is sitting, uh, waiting for the Trudeau government to ratify as well. So those aren't even done yet. We're looking at some uh, considerable changes to our uh, patent regime and copyright regime that okay. will have costs for Canadian hold, consumers. Hold off there. Let's get Laura to comment. First of all, on uh, whether you share Jim Balsillie's concerns that Canadian negotiators got outmaneuvered, and then we'll go on from there. 
Well, it's, it's, uh, it's no surprise. I'm going to take the pro-innovation piece in this argument. And I'm quite surprised that Jim Balsillie, who is espousing a pro-innovation agenda for Canada, would not be promoting Canada's opportunities and access abroad, not promoting protections for innovators, not promoting rule of law in new markets. Now, I do understand that Mr. Mr. Balsillie had a challenge with a patent infringement case in the United States, a patent troll issue. Didn't end well for him. And he would really prefer that uh, uh, that particular issue not be spread to the other TPP countries. I get that. But if it's a narrow issue for one company, uh, I don't see tarring the whole TPP and all of Canada and the Canadian economy because your industry happened to get uh, a, a, bad, uh, a bad result in a U.S. Well, court. Let me, let it's me just not fair to the rest of Canada. Let me just jump in on that, Laura. I'm, I'm not here to speak for him, obviously, but I think, I think his concerns go deeper than merely his own personal experience with this. He's looking sector-wide and he finds it wanting. Is that not a proper conclusion to draw? No, let's look sector wide. First of all, the last meaningful agreement that Canada had that dealt with ele uh, that dealt with anything to do with the, with the digital economy was the 1994 NAFTA. We need things to deal with the modern electronic commerce economy. The TPP contains a chapter on electronic commerce. It contains prohibitions uh, that would block data flows that Canadian exporters of digital services need. Uh, it uh, does very little damage to the Canadian pharmaceutical uh, consumer. It really does not affect pricing at all. But what it does to do is it encourages innovation in the biological sector, which is a high-tech sector that Canada is and should continue to be on the front edge of. Stuart, let's talk uh, cars and trucks. Uh, apparently, there is some concern uh, here because the allotted amount of time to phase out Japanese tariffs or tariffs on Japanese auto imports is five years for Canada and 30 years for the United States. That's quite a discrepancy. Why is it so big? It is. If, if you don't mind, I'd like to go back for a second to an issue of e-commerce. Um, I mean, uh, this is an area, there are significant privacy concerns here too. Um, the e-commerce chapter is going to have a section that forces or prohibits uh, companies from requiring servers and information to be stored in, in Canada. That's going to affect privacy of people at health clinics, this kind of thing. Um, in terms of costs, I would say that the European trade deal on pharmaceuticals, the estimates, and they're conservative, is that it will cost Canadian consumers, or at least healthcare systems, purchases of drugs, uh, upwards of about $850 million annually, which is twice as much as consumers are going to save in terms of tariff savings in the EU deal. So there are, there are costs in the copyright and intellectual property chapters for Canadians. Okay. Um, on auto, five years to phase out tariffs on Japanese imports for us, That's right. 30 years for the U.S. That's right. Why and the difference? I, it's hard to know why the difference is there. Uh, there's probably a number of things like that we're going to see as we analyze the deal in, in Parliament and outside. Um, obviously, there's going to be an impact on the North American auto sector. I think we've seen concerns from not just the, uh, the unions in the United States and Canada, but the, the automakers themselves. They're worried about this low rule of origin that's going to come into effect. Uh, in which case components and vehicles that were mostly made in China will be able to get into, uh, into Canada tariff-free, even though they aren't t from the TPP zone. Um, it's, uh, you know, there's been estimates of 22,000, 25,000 job losses uh, from the TPP, and those are based on Unifor estimates. So, yeah, it's, it's a significant uh, thing to, to look into. Laura Dawson, any explanation on your end for the discrepancy there? I'm... Again, I'm going to go the other direction entirely. I really believe that Canada needs to be focusing on those sectors that are competitive and growing and in which we have a global advantage. If you uh, uh, read the newspapers recently, Canada has, is experiencing some of the largest job loss in high, uh, uh, high technology, science technology uh, jobs that we've had uh, in many years. We need to reverse that. And so when we look at a sector like the auto sector, we need to consider the source of the criticism. Is it uh, an entity that is trying to preserve a protected market for Canada to keep out competition, to keep prices high? Or is it a source like uh, the auto parts sector in, in Ontario, uh, Linamar and Martin Ray, who say we are ready to compete globally, we are ready to get out there and show the world the best that Canada has. When I look at the auto sector, uh, when I look at the auto chapter, first of all, you have to recall that 
the TPP parties are not all starting in the same place. We all have different, uh, different uh, tariff levels, different rules of origin, diff different standards and technical barriers. So you can't say, oh, we did not get exactly the same as Party B, because we all started in a different place. Uh, so, so that's one issue. Um, uh, but, but secondly, when you read the chapter, it is full of all sorts of safeguards that say, you know, we think that this is going to be OK for the Canadian sector, but if it results in unanticipated import surges, unanticipated disruptions. We have safeguard and snapback mechanisms that will compensate and bring us back to status quo. We are trying to do new trade and new competitive practices, but we recognize that it might have unintended consequences and we're prepared to, to you know, cover that if necessary. Stuart, are you not giving adequate attention to the safeguards and so-called snapbacks that are in this agreement? No, I, I think I'm, I'm looking more at the effect that some of these previous agreements have had on, on uh, U.S. exports, Canadian exports, and things like manufactured goods. Uh, you know, if we look at the Korea deal, for example, in the States, uh, imports jumped 50 percent. You know, the, the trade deficit grew considerably. Uh, after we signed that, after the U.S. signed that deal with Korea, the same thing we're seeing already with uh, with the Canadian-Korea deal. Um, the reality is, there's going to be a negative impact when you're exporting more and more uh, raw, low, low process, low value-added goods, as these deals tend to do. Uh, force Canada down that path, and you're bringing in more of these high value-added products. You're going to see your trade deficit uh, grow, and you're going to have to see an impact on jobs. And I'm not sure that we should so casually just say, well, certain sectors that are competitive. Uh, are going are gonna to do well, and others that, like auto, which act actually is competitive, is very productive. Canadian plants are very productive. It's you know, one of the most important sectors in the Canadian economy. I'm not sure that we should be discounting the views of the auto sector, and especially auto workers, when we sign these deals, and they're saying, watch out. Uh, we're going to see job losses, or we're going to see production go overseas. I think we have to pay very close attention to what they're saying. Well, we did just hear last but month I'm, that I, But, but Rav... I'm not discounting... I'm, go ahead, Sorry, Laura. Sorry, Steve, but I'm not discounting the views of the auto sector. I'm simply saying we need to give the competitive, high-tech, advanced auto sector a chance to be competitive in the world. And, and Toyota, I think it was, just announced last month that they're going to do the RAV4 at Cambridge, which is a big boost to that plant there. They are, and they're going to send all their small cars to Mexico, right? So, I mean, there's, there's a lot happening, a lot of uh, concern in the auto sector here in, in Ontario. Um, this deal is, uh, is, is, is raising a lot of red flags for workers and producers. Well, let's find out if there's any red flags being raised here for farmers. Laura, I'll go to you first on this. You know, the supply management... Let me put it this way. The very controversial supply management system is still intact and in place. So the Harper government did not give that up, as many people feared they would. Having said that, uh, the crack in the door for offshore competition is a little bigger now. And I wonder whether our dairy farmers in particular need to be nervous about that. What's your view? Well, uh, the, the crack of the door is a little wider, but our dairy farmers have been given basically 10 years of guaranteed in income protection. I don't know what your employment conditions are, Steve, but mine don't give me 10 years of, of income protection. So I agree that we are uh, entering a transition phase for the dairy. We've taken up a lot of time talking about Canadian dairy. Uh, frankly, I'm very excited about Canada's competitive export sectors, oil seeds, wheat, pork. Uh, the Asian demand for proteins is huge. Soybeans. Let's get out there and service that, that huge market rather than wring our hands about 2.5 percent of the Canadian dairy consumption market. Just for the record, we work in public television here, so we don't have 10 minutes, let alone 10 years of job protection. But that's another story for another day. Uh, do you want to come back on that, on the supply management issue? Uh, no, I mean, it, it was, I think it was, the government did the right thing by, by protecting this industry. I mean, the, Canada's dairy farmers uh, support a lot of healthy communities. It would be a shame to see a system that's worked for them uh, that we think has worked for consumers in terms of stability of prices. If you look over the, the past year, for example, on, on uh, food product prices, a lot of them have gone up considerably. You look at meats, uh, dairy has stayed virtually the same from 2013 to 2014. So there's benefits to the system. Um, it's good to see it, it safeguarded. I would say uh, there's a lot of other vested interests that uh, were pampered to a much larger degree in the TPP than the dairy farmers were. And, I, and again, we talked about them at the beginning. It's big pharma, it's the entertainment industry. These companies get essentially virtual monopoly protection in these free trade deals, so which is a... So let's figure out then, Laura, to you first on this. If there are, we, we have to remember the obvious thing here, which is it is the previous conservative government that negotiated this deal and signed off on it. There's now a new liberal government in place, which had nothing to do with creating this agreement. And my question is, 
Does the new federal government have any levers at its disposal to renegotiate, Laura, what it doesn't like about the current agreement? I guess it has a lever available to renegotiate. If they're asking me as an advisor, I would say definitely not. What we've seen historically is when it, an agreement has been negotiated by one party and then has to be implemented by another, both in Canada and in the United States, that the new government finds a way to put a stamp of approval or something unique, a particular brand, or address something that they're particularly concerned about with more emphasis, with more focus. That's how we ended up with the side agreements on labor and the environment and the NAFTA. That's how we ended up with the human rights chapter uh, in the Canada-Columbia agreement. So uh, I think there's an opportunity to, to uh, tweak, to customize the agreement. But I think if Canada were to try to fundamentally uh, 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 renegotiate this agreement, that we would fall off uh, the TPP table entirely. I'm frankly more concerned that the U.S. won't be able to ratify because I think it's a very important agreement and we need to make sure that we are moving forward. Well, let's just put some numbers up here which uh, speak to your concerns about whether the Americans will negotiate this thing. Sheldon, board number two, if we could, right now. Uh, the United States economy is a 17-plus trillion dollar economy, uh, representing 61 percent of the countries involved here. Uh, Japan at 4.6 trillion is 16 percent of the economic development. Uh, Canada at, now this is 1.79 trillion U.S., so we're around 2 trillion Canadian dollars, 6 percent of the deal. Australia, one, almost one and a half trillion, and then Mexico at a little over one and a quarter trillion, slightly under five percent of the economy represented in this. So clearly the Americans are the hugest players in this agreement. Um, what does that mean in terms of their ability to get this agreement through their Congress and make the changes that they may want to see that others may not? It's really hard. Uh, can I just jump in? It's, yeah, I sure. just say there, there can be no agreement unless the U.S. ratifies because the, the rules as they're set out in the current TPP are there must be at least six TPP parties and 85% of TPP uh, uh, represented in those parties that agree to go ahead. And we must have the U.S. in order to get that 85% number. No, no, I hear you on that. Fair enough. But my, my question is, if, if the, given the size of the American economy relative to all of the other players in this 12-country agreement, uh, presumably, they have more clout to get whatever changes they may not like in this thing at this stage of the game through, and therefore can, and therefore everybody else has to live with it? I don't know. Stuart, start, start us on that. It's going to be very interesting what happens in the U.S. from, from this point on. So uh, the 90, we're into the 90-day period of reviewing it in Congress before the president uh, signs it or not. I imagine he's going to sign it at the end of that period. But there's a lot of talk uh, from senators and Congress uh, people about uh, making changes. Some of them don't think it goes far enough on, on patents, for example, for biologics. Some of them think it goes too far uh, in terms of the offshoring uh, potential for, for U.S. manufacturing. So we're going to have to keep an eye on what's going on there. I think that actually gives uh, the Trudeau government some room to stand up and say, well, we're going to review it as well. Um, it, it would represent real change, according, you know, as their platform said, in yeah. terms of negotiating and, and ratifying deals Except in Canada. Except that America is 61 plus percent of the economy is represented, and we're six. Uh, it's 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 true, but that's not to say we should just roll over and take the deal as is if they're not going to. And there's a good chance they won't. Previously, uh, Canadian governments would simply uh, send a deal to Parliament after it's been signed. So basically, they would say there's nothing we can do. You know, there's no, no way we can change it. It's either up, down, yes or no vote. Mm. You know, real change on a trade agreement in Canada would be giving Parliament the opportunity to review it in advance, especially when, keep in mind, Trudeau, the Trudeau government just saw this deal a few weeks ago. It, it, they, it, it was negotiated and concluded during, a, what do they call it, a caretaker government, right? Mm -hmm. With no uh, involvement from either opposition party during uh, or before the election. So there's a good argument to be made that we can go to Parliament with the promise that if there are things we can't live with, we can we can take them out of the deal. Let's find out, since, Laura, you're in the American capital, what's your prognosis on once senators and congressmen get a look at this thing, how much they're going to want to tweak it and whether they're going to be able to? Well, 
I, I think there's a fundamental misapprehension, both in Canada and in the United States, that these deals are kept, you know, secret from the legislators, secret from the, the business associations. They are done with a lot of consultation. Nobody, USTR, uh, Canada's uh, Department of uh, International Trade, they don't go in and negotiate an auto chapter or uh, a services chapter without really, really talking to the stakeholders. And so it's a bit disingenuous for folks when the deal comes out to say, oh, I'm shocked and appalled. I had no idea that was in there. Of course, they knew it was in there and they probably agreed in advance. But if it gives them an opportunity for some political leverage, then they're going to use that opportunity to, to exert what they might see as a better deal. And I think that's the challenge in the United States. It really is about politics right now. Uh, with this session of Congress, you know, rapidly, the clock rapidly running down, um, with them coming into a presidential election, uh, uh, with it uh, being a democratic uh, uh, agreement, but it's usually the Republicans that are traditionally pro-trade. Are the Republican trade supporters going to give the Democrats, going to give a Democratic president any any extra credibility, any extra support? Or are they going to be looking at how this plays off in their larger electoral fortune, fortunes? So that's a problem. I think what needs to happen here in, in the United States is that business really needs to step forward. There has not been a strong business constituency coming forward in the United States, except for the folks that Stuart mentioned, the, the pharmas, the entertainment industry, etc. We need manufacturers, high-tech manufacturers, advanced manufacturing, folks that are uh, wanting to benefit from global supply chains to also step up and make their voices heard. If they don't, uh, I would say it's a near-run thing here in the U.S. And one quick follow-up to you on this, Laura. Um, People are going to be wondering what's going to happen to the NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, if the Trans-Pacific Partnership is passed. What's the relationship between those two? Okay, there are trade lawyers out there who are now hitting their hands uh, with their hitting their foreheads with their hands. But basically, uh, the the agreement is like uh, the NAFTA is like a foundation agreement. Actually, the WTO agreements are the foundation agreement. Free trade agreements that are negotiated around the world are meant to be compliant with the WTO. The NAFTA is compliant with the WTO. And anything that goes deeper or beyond the NAFTA in the TPP will supersede uh, what's in the NAFTA. It will be, you know, like a, a, an extra level of commitment or depth or expansion. So the NAFTA is not going anywhere. It's being added to. Understood. Let me read uh, something uh, written by Blaine Haggard, who's a poli-sci prof at Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario. Uh, this is him writing in the Globe and Mail last month. The big problem is that the TPP-like agreements are no longer exclusively or even primarily about reducing traditional trade barriers. As Harvard economist Danny Roderick notes in his 2011 book, The Globalization Paradox, with some exceptions, such as Canada's dairy industry, tariffs have never been lower. Any gains from further reductions would be relatively modest. Instead, agreements such as the TPP are about implementing policies that have nothing to do with comparative advantage, policies that are often designed to lead to higher consumer costs and concentrated corporate power. Treated as marginal issues, these policies are, quote, free trade, free riders, coasting along on an unearned legitimacy. Okay, let's pick that apart a little bit. Stuart, your view of that, of that view. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, and especially in certain areas, as we've talked about already today, uh, intellectual property rights. These are, like for example, a patent locks away uh, the right to make profit on a certain pill or whatever, a medical device, for 20 plus years. Um, it locks away the uh, ability for generic, potential generic competition to see the research that went into producing it for five to eight years. Um, you know, these are essentially deals that are designed to basically monopoly rights. They protect monopoly rights for these companies. And I think that's what we're getting at in that quote. Another area that is totally baffling when it comes to free trade is this idea that uh, foreign investors should get greater protections in uh, for other markets, in the Canadian market, uh, than national firms have. And we get this through the investment chapter. And this is something we haven't talked about too much in Canada yet because Canada is so used to signing these investment protections into its free trade agreements that we don't look at the history that they've had in Canada. We've seen in the past year an environmental assessment process declared illegal by a NAFTA tribunal of three paid arbitrators who basically didn't really didn't know what they were talking about in this case. 
um, and uh, are, are, will be fining Canada, will be essentially getting sued for uh, going through a legal process and deciding that a quarry shouldn't be built in Nova Scotia. Canada is uh, the most sued country in the NAFTA region under this process. Um, it's about 60% of the cases involve environmental or resource related uh, policy measures that governments implement. So this is really, these deals are essentially corporate rights deals when you think about it. Uh, and on top of it, these uh, we're granting foreign firms rights that national firms don't have to bypass the Canadian courts whenever they don't like uh, a measure that a government has taken. Laura, can you help us as well by just telling us what do you think he means when he says free trade, free riders? What is that? Uh, you know, th th this is uh, there's there's a lot of topics here from uh, from uh, Brock University to uh, to quarries in Nova Scotia. Uh, I was right up. I was with the professor right up until he said uh, nothing to do with comparative advantage. He's absolutely right. Trade agreements are not so much about tariffs anymore because average industrial tar tariffs are relatively low. Free trade agreements are now about much more intractable and challenging areas of of trade uh, trade distortions what we call non-tariff barriers. So these are things like different uh, types of licensing so that before you can export your product from Canada to China, let's say that it has to go through 17 different inspections and so it is practically impossible for you to get that product from Canada to China. So what we do in free trade agreements is we try to have mutual recognition of inspection and certification and safety so that it is much easier for products to move. Uh, we try to make sure that there are no unnecessary barriers to trade. But, but it's tricky and that's the thing that the TPP has really tried to get into in things like electronic commerce, in terms of state-owned enterprises. Uh, we haven't mentioned that and that's a very important chapter in, in the TPP. Um, we want to make sure that when we're trading with, with uh, countries where uh, government-owned enterprises have a big stake in the economy, that those enterprises act like commercial businesses, that you don't have the full weight of government leaning on you, breaking the rules. We want a level playing field. And that, like Stuart was saying, yeah, he was talking about investor state dispute settlement uh, in the Canadian perspective. I want to turn that around and look at the interests of Canadians and having investor protections in new markets where we've never been before. We've never won in a case, Kyrgyzstan's so. and Kazakhstan's. Uh, Canadian investors and Canadian companies can compete the world over, but we do need some basic investor protection so that our property isn't seized and expropriated without any legal recourse. Try again, Stuart? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I can see Canadian investors, mining companies especially, are uh, largely supportive of these investment protections we build into these trade deals. I mean, the reality is, and the CCPA took a look at the record, uh, is that they don't do very well when they challenge foreign government policies overseas. Um, it's, it's, so it's a system that isn't working for Canadian investors, that is in Canada resulting in things like a, a ban on a moratorium on fracking in Quebec being challenged as a trade barrier. Um, a policy like a, a de denial of a permit for a quarry, again in Nova Scotia, that's a trade barrier. Uh, we have cases where a court ordered uh, revocation of uh, patents for a, a U.S. drug company are being challenged as a trade barrier. This is our courts, right? This is a decision of the courts that's considered a trade barrier under NAFTA. And here we are expanding the system to the TPP and to Europe. 97 to 98 percent of investment in Canada will now be covered by these extreme investor rights that are being challenged in Europe. There was a protest, if I can just mention the protest in Europe in October. 250,000 people came out to protest this deal that the, the previous government was trumping, the Canada-Europe trade agreement, because of these investor rights, because they see them as nothing but uh, a big uh, hand away to these large corporations. Um, there's a good chance the European deal will fail unless we take them out of that deal. And I think that Trudeau, the Trudeau government can use that opportunity to say, well, we don't like them in the TPP either, um, because it's, it's time we really revise, uh, look at uh, that one, even that one element of these deals. Laura, let me give you the last word let, and let's make it on... Yeah, uh, Stuart, Go ahead. St Stuart is, 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 is selecting cases, is very selective in the cases. Uh, Canadian mining companies aside, Canadian banks, Canadian manufacturers, Canadian financial services companies, Canadian IT companies, Canadian gaming companies, companies that are building their intellectual capital in Canada, that are going to Canada's excellent uh, universities, building the brains trust and trying to export their services, technology, and innovation abroad. We need protections for them. We need protections for their intellectual property. We need protections for their ability to invest and expand in the world. That's what these agreements give us.
The debate shall continue, and we thank both of you for having part of it here on TVO with us tonight. Laura Dawson, Canada Institute at the Wilson Center in Washington. Stuart True, Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. My thanks to you both. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.